Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session on interaction design and techniques at Dimension Computer. My name is Thomas Kosch, and together with the coach Andy Matvienko, we will guide you through the session. The session is packed with 10 papers, so we have seven short papers, two full papers, and one invited talk. And if you have any questions during the presentation or after the presentation, you can ask them in YouTube. There you can ask your questions in English or in German, and we will try to convey the message to the authors. Also, we want to hint you that if there is not enough time to ask questions, you can also go to the breakout rooms after the session and talk to the authors directly. And with this, I feel honored to introduce the first talk with the title, Blinded by Novelty, a reflection on participant curiosity and novelty in automated vehicle studies based on experiences from the field presented by Alexander Mernick. And with this, we will see the first presentation. Hello and welcome to the presentation of the paper titled Blinded by Novelty, a reflection on participant curiosity and novelty in automated vehicle studies based on experiences from the field. Pretty lengthy title, but it will make sense in a while. So getting right to the topic, what I want to share with you today are some mismatches in perception versus what we think how automation needs to be presented and how it gets seen by the public. And uh, to start off, I'll give you a quick rundown of currently what I would say is a pretty agreeable assessment of the state of the art as it is right now with regards to real, uh, vehicle automation. And well, what is the case on the road right now is that we're still primarily operating on SAE level two as far as what is actually out there and as far as regulations are concerned outside of specific uh, test deployments. The transition to and beyond SE level three is a tricky one due to several reasons uh, related to emergency transitions, but also mixed traffic and detransition phase uh, and a lack of infrastructure communication. Uh, in that same vein, um, vehicle automation is not just sensor-based driving, that's a big part of it, but also uh, vehicle to X as in vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure communication integration. So there is uh, quite a a tandem effort necessary, both as far as vehicle equipment is concerned, but also uh, infrastructure equipment is concerned, communication standards and so on and so forth before these visions of, you know, fully automated driving are being realized. And while the technology is rapidly advancing, it is still work in progress and will remain as such for a while, which I think uh, puts it pretty accurately. Um, now here is what uh, we like to show everyone else, and that is our vision. So I'm not calling out uh, anyone in particular here. It's just that these were, uh, I like them a lot and they, they do illustrate the matter quite well. So this is uh, Bosch press material. And what you can see here is, well, a vehicle that does what it's supposed to do. And, you know, it's driving in uh, not the most ideal conditions, it's raining and, and everything, and it just, it's able to do its job. And it's connected and everything, as you can see on the right, it's just working. It's working the way it should. And as we know, automation technology is not quite working the way it should. But of course, that is not the vision that we want to have, right? And the vision we're having is what we're seeing right here. Uh, another example um, is the uh, from the Easy Mile Easy Ten press materials. And here you can actually see the vehicle itself. But what you can see are all the awesome, you know, application areas where it purportedly is already working and most definitely is already being used. So in general, uh, taking all of this together, you get the impression that vehicle automation is working pretty well. And I mean, especially if we're looking here, well, it works at the airport, the hospitals, public transport connection, residential areas, amusement parks, rural areas, business parks, industrial sites, and universities. Well, where doesn't it work, right? So why are we not having fully automated vehicles on the roads like immediately? And that is a valid question. That is one that we are equipped to answer because we have to answer it all the time because it mostly defines our work and gives us work in that sense. But also it's, uh, it leads to certain mismatches. And uh, this is where I wanna give you some examples from, uh, from our studies and our research where we saw these mismatches to create actual problems. So we're working on the Digitalist project. Uh, we're working actually with an Easy Mile, uh, Easy 10 shuttle. And one of the things we wanted to do is get a requirements with children if such uh, shuttles are deployed on the road with regards to communication requirements, because these shuttles will not be 100% safe and there will be mixed traffic. So 
And what we just did is have a playful environment with them, uh, play some scenarios for them, and then just ask them questions. Well, what would you want to know from this vehicle in order to be able to operate it safely? Uh, and you will not operate it, but in order to interact with it safely and many such things. And the, the responses we would get were very, very often uh, in the vein of, I need nothing. I don't need anything. Uh, I saw them on TV. They were super safe. I saw the demos. They like stopped all the time in front of the press guys. I didn't call them press guys, but that's what they said. They're extremely safe and there is nothing we need to know. And uh, we heard it a lot of time and that was a problem because uh, we couldn't get very good results. And also that is just not correct, right? Uh, should we teach them to, to not uh, take care anymore just because there's an automated shuttle on the road? Well, no. Another experience we had was an interaction study with pedestrians where we told them, uh, once again, there we evaluated communication designs and told them just interact with the bus as they would with a normal regular vehicle. And as you can see here, that is not what they did. Instead, uh, they would just obstruct its way, just uh, stand around it and just make its life as hard as possible. And basically we had the choice, um, do we continue like that or do we distract them so hard that we're not even getting any results anymore? So in the end, what we, what we got, and when we tried to simulate a real environment where people who are not acting the way that they would or would be expected as rational individuals in the end, uh, if such vehicles are deployed in the street. And this is because uh, we believe we're selling them a different uh, state of the art than we currently do because we're always telling them of the vision and also in research, we're telling them of the successes. And now the question is, right, okay, now we know that, what can we do about that? And this is where I would, well, first of all, invite you to read the paper where we give some more details on uh, the experiences we made and uh, what these, uh, how these can be mitigated, what our role as academia and research is, uh, is in that. But also we'll have uh, 20 more minutes in the course of this discussion. So I'd like to also discuss the review together. And for everyone else who is viewing this uh, on YouTube or any other video sharing site, do feel free to drop me an email and uh, discuss this matter with me because I don't think it's going to go away that soon as long as the technology is still in progress. Thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting talk. Uh, just another hint, in YouTube you can select between live chat and top chat and it's recommended to select live chat at the top of the chat. So there's a drop down menu. And also you're invited to ask questions now via YouTube. And uh, while the first questions come in, I have a question. So it's really interesting to see how we have to enhance the communication and the information we distribute over automated vehicles with the pedestrians um, to not have like this false impression that level three vehicles are super safe and nothing can happen to you when you cross the street because you already know that this vehicle will have some emergency system that will stop uh, before, before hurting you. Um, and what I'm asking myself, if we equip cars with such a technology, will that be enough for the future? Or do you believe that you would also need sensors that are integrated in the, to the environment um, to track all of these vehicles, maybe even pedestrians, children, and so on? So that's a good question. Um, so I guess less into the educative aspect, but into the technological. And I think, so if we think far ahead, uh, like everything is level five, then uh, paradoxically enough, we'll probably need less uh, equipment because then everything that's part of the infrastructure can just communicate with each other. But especially for the transition phase, I do agree that if we take this seriously, that we have uh, automated vehicles to work to some extent, but not to every extent because they cannot, because there are always these unknown variables, which is everything that is human and that is not connected, then you need uh, different means uh, to capture this. And which is also why I think there must be a minimum of caution in every individual because the technology is going to work, but it will have some limitations and we will need to, to be raised to that new level that we have to be cautious in this new environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting view because like my impression is that more and more people try to try to build around the car, but do not take the environmental factors into account. That's true. We just, we just got a question uh, from YouTube. Um, I will just read it as it is. Uh, great topic. What about smart in-vehicle assistants? Can they be used to make users' expectations align with reality? Asked by Markus Funk. Well, without knowing uh, what the exact uh, assistant would do, I would say in general, yes, they can, as long as it's an uh, 
auxiliary system or interface that can give you additional information, yes, th this would be one of the means to properly calibrate their expectations also as the end user, right? Because we're often acting from this perspective of people who more or less know what's going on also on a technical level. But in the end, what you need to do as somebody who maybe not even uses that technology, but is surrounded and impacted by the technology, you need to at least be informed what can I do and what do I have to do? And this is something where I can't be expected to read manual spec sheets. I need to know how this thing works. And part of this is the, perspe uh, the, the perception I get over you know, media channels and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very um, much, Alexander. Yeah, I have I have another question. If you if you don't mind, <laughs> uh, Alex, I skipped also through your paper, and in the discussion section, I found a very interesting thought, uh, which I also which I will quote now here, uh, that in many cases it was even possible to gather any usable results, as an effect on the participants' behavior was so strong and disruptive that they were no longer able to act as a rational being uh, would be in real life context or even complete the task given to them in the experiment, which for me was quite an interesting thought in the discussion. And I was asking myself, so why do you think this is, this is the case? Is it related to say to the trust uh, to technology people developed over, over many years of using it, you know, with the smartphones and all other devices that we're surrounded with? What are your thoughts on that? I think it's a combination of Overcalibrated trust, I believe this. So it's so just uh, way too much overtrust, which is induced by the impressions you get from everything you see about these technologies. Where even internally within the scientific communities, right, we we are aware that we must uh, communicate successes and also the failures, but the successes are always more important. And when you communicate it far uh, further to the outside, the successes get more and more important. The failures uh, less so. And every single achievement that we make, we understand that it's just one step ahead. But whenever it gets communicated outside as well, automation is awesome part one, automation is awesome part two or three. So it's part of this. And the other part is also most certainly group dynamics and the knowledge that if you are uh, a participant in such a study, deep down, you know, nothing can happen. So you combine with your curiosity towards a new technology, the false impression you have from how it's being communicated to you, uh, being in sort of a laid back environment with more than one participant, and you have this recipe for disaster there. And uh, essentially, after five minutes, they forgot the instructions they were given, which was act like, like you would in a normal road environment. And I can tell you, nobody in there acted like they would have in a normal road environment, or they would be dead by now. Because that was just not rational at all. You just walk in front of the vehicle and stand there, and hey, it's going to stop anyway. Well, not all of them might. So, but it seems that the novelty and trust in this respect somehow correlate, right? So do you think that it will have somehow dissimulate with time so that people will become more suspicious about the technology that I'm using after? I would assume so. Like with everything, the more it permeates our life, the more we are uh, exhibited or exposed to it, the more we learn to use it. Now the problem with uh, vehicle automation is that it's a safety critical technology. So this will come at a price, right? And uh, think of the accidents we already had. So eventually this trust calibration will happen. Uh, I'm just hoping it won't happen after many more accidents. So of course it will be a natural process, but I think there is also something uh, we can in that regard. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the question. And um, it's a really interesting topic. And if you have more questions, you can go to the breakout rooms and ask them there directly. And uh, with this, Andre will announce the next talk. Yes, so the next paper is called Affinity for Technology Interaction and Fields of Study, Implications for Human-Centered Design of Applications for Public Administration. And this paper is going to be presented by Daniel Besser from University of Lübeck. And Hello, my name is Danny Wessel and I'm presenting the short paper Affinity for Technology Interaction in Fields of Study. Affinity for Technology Interaction describes a person's tendency to approach or avoid interaction with technology. At the low end we have people who really don't like to interact with technology, and at the high end we have you. At least it's highly likely that you have high RTE if you attend this conference. Why is RTE important for human-centered design? RTE is normally distributed in the population, but if we do user studies, we might attract participants with high RTE. They are more likely to volunteer for these studies, but they also bias our sample. Over time, we might optimize for those with high RTE, 
which might lead to a Matthew effect that gets better for those who like to interact with technology and worse for those who do not. But this is an assumption, so let's look at some empirical data. So we ask regarding RTE, do students of public administration differ from students of media and computer science? Do students of public administration differ from people who work in public administration and were recruited via an online forum? And how do these uh, samples compare to each other, especially in comparison to a quota sample of the German population? Comparing the students, both are classroom samples, so they more or less all had to participate, and both are so-called digital natives, but not surprisingly, for media and computer science, RTE is much higher. What about the students of public administration and the online sample of public administration employees? They also differ significantly regarding the ATE scores, with the online sample having higher RTE, despite being on average over a decade older. Adding the German quota sample, we see that it's similar to the students in public administration. And these two samples differ significantly from the online sample of public administration employees and from the sample of media and computer science students. While the online sample of public administration employees and the media and computer science students did not differ significantly. So yes, we find a sample bias. If we are using self-selected online samples, even in a form that is about public administration in general, we risk getting participants who are too similar in RTE to ourselves and not representing the whole user group in public administration. Convenience online samples seem like a bad idea. It appears to be much better to use classroom samples, for example during vocational training or further qualification, or to use a cluster sampling in general. No matter which sample you use, it's a good idea to also measure RTE to check that you do not iteratively optimize for a biased sample. Of course there are limitations and caveats, they are in the paper, but we can also talk about them now. If you would like to know more, we have the questionnaire in multiple languages on our website, on which we also provide some additional information. If you have any questions, simply send us an email. And thank you very much, and now I'm looking forward to the discussion. Yeah, so that was the video about the paper, and we have uh, the first author in the audience, uh, Daniel Wessel. You can participate in our discussion and maybe tell us a bit more about the paper. So uh, before we have any questions in YouTube, so I also invite the audience to ask questions in the YouTube chat. Um, I will start with the first one. Um, so Daniel, I saw that in, in the paper, you had also different ratios between, so the, of the age of the participants, also gender, and at the end of the day, for, for all four samples, so to say, you also had different sizes. Mm -hmm. It was also really interesting to, to see that. Can you maybe elaborate a bit more on this ratio between the age groups that you observed uh, throughout this exploration and maybe some insights between the gender and how they use? Because I also saw that mm -hmm. it was predominantly male participants that you had in the study. Yeah, I mean, it uh, depends a little bit on the sample. I mean, the students of public administration, there were a lot of females uh, in the sample. Um, but yeah, if you look at media from computer science, for example, you have more men in it than women. But if you look, for example, for sex differences, um, um, we have looked at the data, but it's difficult due to sample sizes. Um, and it doesn't look um, that there are sex differences, for example, in media and computer science students, because they are so self-selected, they study something with technology, so they all have really high RTE uh, scores. So you wouldn't really expect any differences there. Uh, and I think this will also hold true if the sample sizes are larger. In the German um, quota sample, for example, we do have these differences with the usual results that men are, uh, have a higher affinity for technology interactions than women. Um, I'm not sure about the students of public administration. I would have to look at the data. Um, we had this analysis done, but um, we had to shorten it to a short paper and uh, something got lost on the way. Uh, regarding age, there's this uh, frequent conception that, uh, okay, if people are older, they don't like to interact that much with technology. And we find this if you look at the quota sample. Um, but uh, there are also other factors here. And yeah, there are confounding variables. But uh, for example, the online sample um, of public administration employees, these are people who work in public administration or öffentliche Verwaltung. Uh, and they were recruited in a forum, which is not specifically about technology, but it's online. And um, this uh, leads to a really large bias here. And they are much more similar to the students of media and computer science than to the, we assume, uh, usual people working in public administration. 
So even um, you can look at the biographical data, many people assess it and find out, okay, sex should work out, age also, they're older, but they're still uh, highly self-selected and they like to interact with technology. And this is, an, I think, an issue um, if you uh, work with them, they give you probably different uh, answers than people who are at the low end and just want technology to work. They don't want to explore it. They don't want to really interact with it. Um, I had a very short question with regards to, mm -hmm. the, to the sample you actually had in your study. So as far as I understood, most of them were students, right? And um, oh, okay, question. Are Sorry. there any plans to extend this to a normal distribution of different age groups? Uh, we have such a sample. We have the German quota sample. It's not a really um, random sample because um, we send students to different marketplaces in, uh, in different cities and ask people uh, according to um, their estimated age group, which worked out okay. Um, sex, much more easier. And uh, education, which was really difficult, but we have uh, a sam sample that is closely matched to the population. This is why, the, if you look at the presentation, the green samples, the germ quota samples, this is something what we would expect RTE to be in the population. Mm -hmm. um, regarding the public administration employees, for example, um, we're working in um, e-government and we're looking to uh, use this as a variable when we do surveys so that we get uh, a broader a sample here because so far we only have this online sample. Um, and well, the student samples are, <laughs> they are available in the classroom, they can't run away. So um, these are a log logical first step. But I think they're also useful because the students of today are going to be the people who work in public administration, for example. And uh, as we see in the differences here, it's not that the digital natives all like to interact with technology. You have a very similar distribution compared to the current uh, population. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, thank you. Time, uh, we thank Daniel Wessel again. And okay. we continue with the next video, which is will be presented from Matthias Merck from the Hochschule Reutlingen with the title Innovation Enabling, Automatisierte Dokumentation und Moderation von Brainstorming-Sitzungen in Kleingruppen. Hello, my name is Matthias Merck. I'm a research assistant at Reutlingen University in Germany. In this video, I will introduce you into our ideas in a field we like to call innovation enabling. Using the example of brainstorming, I will show you our holistic approach on supporting early ideation phases. Before we get into the details of our concept, I'd like to show you our prototype. For further detail on our design methodology, please refer to our paper. The prototype is based around the standing table with a controllable LED band around it and a combination of a projector, camera, and microphone mounted above the table. The table is suitable for up to five people. In this setting, the table is divided into three individual workspaces and a common results area in the center of the table, visualizing the remaining time. The visualization is adaptive and reacts to the group's performance. Interaction with the system is implicit. A recommender engine decides when and how a system intervention takes place based on metadata of the brainstorming session. This participant is marking the group's results for further individual work on it. We call this approach digital takeaway. The camera is also used for result documentation. When a sticky note is placed on the table, the note together with some metadata like timestamps and the author of the note is automatically stored into a graph database for further processing and augmentation. Our system is based around a concept we call awareness pipeline. It's a data stream fed by a microphone and camera mounted above the table. The raw data is processed and augmented by various analysis components like voice and object detection algorithms. Additional metadata is calculated based on the data in the awareness pipeline. A recommender system uses the metadata to show real-time feedback to both participants and moderator to influence and enhance the brainstorming session. The feedback components are used to generate feedback that is used after the session, including the results and process feedback. We are aware of both technical and ethical limitations of our approach. Auditive and visual disturbances in the room can lead to inappropriate systems reactions. 
We need to find proper thresholds and preconditions for the system's interventions to mitigate the impact of these problems. Further work is needed to ensure data economy and transparency to find a balance between the data needed for the system and the privacy of individuals. Thank you for watching this presentation. Feel free to contact me with any questions regarding our research. Thank you very much, Matthias, for this interesting talk. Uh, while we wait for some questions on YouTube, and here I also want to remind that you can ask questions on YouTube, um, I would have a more technical question. So could you briefly describe how this prototype was working and how the algorithm decided, decided for example, to enlarge the circle now uh, as a sign of engagement? Yeah, the prototype you have seen in this video um, was um, uh, manually controlled. Right now, uh, we checked for uh, visibility of the visualization. Um, but in the future, it's uh, uh, done like we are using the microphone and uh, the camera to um, extract metadata. Some, for example, this would be speech times. How often are speakers changing? Um, are there any more ideas um, coming to the table? And if we see that at the end of the, um, the time boxing that we have chosen for the session, um, a discussion starts, the system would automatically slow down that rising um, uh, center in the middle um, to give uh, the, the people a little more time to uh, do some more work and get more ideas for the system. This is certainly interesting work. I'm looking forward to how this will, how this will look like in the future. Um, did you, so did you also, you said that you evaluated also vis visualizations and the video showed the circle. Um, yeah, did you um, also look at other visualizations? Yeah, we, um, we took the, um, the needs from Hassenzeit and Diefenbach as a, as a base and thought about what could we do, use for, or, or how can we make um, th this um, working for us? So for example, there is um, like uh, autonomy. So we want to make sure that uh, people are changing or deciding which place they stand from themselves. Um, um, it's not, nothing that is um, uh, based on the system. Uh, it's just from the, from the people. We, do, we also wanted to make sure that there is it's like a feel of uh, being together. So even if you've never seen your teammates before, you get on this table and you get a form of visualization to, mm -hmm. to give you the feeling um, that you're a team. We did that by uh, projecting like a, a, a a name for the team, like it's the food team. And uh, mm, there was a banana uh, guy and a, a apple girl, something like that. So you had that, that feeling of being together. Um, uh, and uh, hopefully in the future, um, uh, we will see that this um, will lead to some positive impact into the performance on brainstormings. Great. Uh I have a short question also, Thomas, if you allow, just a bit of a technical setup a question. So you at the moment used a very sort of horizontal setup for recognition yeah. from a camera above. Yeah. Were you considering also setups where you have a whiteboard, people can stick the notes on the vertical space and you also can recognize that and visualize that somehow? We are focusing on early design phases and early ideation phases. So that, uh, that, that, that table that's standing together on the table with that vertical um, interface, um, it's great to, to like uh, uh, enforce people to work together. The, uh, the horizontal um, visual, visual, uh, visualizations um, would be used um, later on like for um, yeah, further work on the, on the data. Um, but it's a concept we, are, we have looked at here. Okay, thank you. Okay, and with this, we are almost perfectly aligned at time. <laughs> and Andri, has the pleasure yeah. to announce the next talk. Yeah, so the next talk that we have in, the, in our today's agenda is called Designing Human Code Interfaces. As the work is going to be presented by Fabian Hammert from Bergische Universität Wuppertal. In this project, we designed seven human God interfaces. The first one is the Chests of Mindfulness, a network of chests to enable a new kind of fasting. An object that the user wants to fast is placed into the chest. In this moment, another user's chest opens. The object that they were fasting is then released. Thus, being able to end one's own fasting depends on others to start theirs. The second object is the flame of prayers, 
It is a feedback mechanism for prayers. Prayers are written on a piece of paper. When burning the paper, the flame changes to a different color. No explanation for the meaning of the color is given. The system thus stimulates reflecting about one's prayer. The third object is the balance of equality. It is a seesaw that counterbalances the weight of people. This is achieved through a weight shifting mechanism inside the seesaw. It symbolizes the idea that to God all people are equal. The fourth object is the light of connectedness. It is a set of connected petroleum lamps. Once one of them is lit, the others will light up too. It helps people to express togetherness over a distance. The fifth object is the box of wishes. It collects and redistributes wishes between people. Once a wish has been given to a new person, the person who uttered it is notified. This helps people to realize that their wishes depend on other people to come true. The sixth object is the candle of sins. At home, small pieces of wax are collected by the members of a church community. At Easter, these pieces are collected in a mold. With this mold, the Easter candle is created. This object helps people to see that they are not alone in their sins and that they are all forgiven. The seventh object is the wall of confessions. It is a semi-public place for confessing. While writing one's confession on it, all others can be read. The rain washes away the confessions, which symbolizes the sins being washed away. This object helps people to realize that, for letting go of one's sins, it often helps to share them. So, thank you, Fabian, for an interesting presentation. Yeah, so uh, we have the first author of uh, Fabian Hammer today to answer the questions about this work. Also, mm -hmm. would like to remind you that we have a chat on YouTube where you can ask your questions uh, directly for the first author. And while we're waiting for the questions, I would like to uh, get started um, with some of the questions that I have. Um, so, um, Fabian, you presented very interesting variety of different prototypes, which are kind of you know different from each other in a way how you can use them. So for demo, some of them you have to go outside, you know, and dry, uh, draw something and dry something on the plates. For some of them you use candles and so on and so forth. So it's a huge variety of things you have to do. Um, the question is, are you planning on kind of running a uh, long-term studies and to, in order to evaluate the usage of those prototypes over a long period of time because I can imagine that people are going to use them very very differently and maybe some of them less frequently but they may, maybe they put more kind of a spiritual value into this and some maybe less frequently for whatever reason I would just to uh, get some insights from you. Mm -hmm. So this was a collaboration project with the Catholic Educational Institute in Bonn. So they are, uh, they are, they have the objects, and we planned on exhibiting this uh, this spring, and then Corona came along. So the plan is, of course, to go you know on tour with it and uh, use them as a discussion starter about what what belief means in the twenty first century and what a modern take on this could be. Um, that's actually how they approach this. He's, in the paper, you will see one of the uh, the co-authors is not from the University of Wuppertal. That's Dr. Dr. Bell, and he had the idea. He he knew that we are pretty good in making intangible things like digital information tangible, and he said, "What if we, you know, started thinking about how can we make belief and God tangible? What kind of experiences would that uh, create?" And, that's how this project came into being. And I hope after, uh, you know, Corona is gone, uh, we will be able to have more discussions with more people about it. That's interesting. And you also, I also think of kind of scaling it because at the moment, as far as I remember, it's only focused on the Catholic church mm -hmm. and some particular, uh, particular mm -hmm. you know, things connected to, to this, but it can, so on, it can be related to other, yes. you know, totally. religious. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I really like about your work. So there's a question on YouTube actually. So uh, oh. Annika is asking, I like the idea of the candle. Have mm -hmm. people really felt connected through the candle? If so, how was this measured? 
Uh, we haven't measured it and we didn't put it into people's homes and that would be of course great uh, and also challenging because igniting a fire remotely is of course complicated and we only have you know uh, evaluated if you want to call it like that in an in exhibition so we, we talked to people while standing next to it so no we don't know that but it and, would be interesting yes and i think we have time for one more question from youtube oh. from matthias heimer mm -hmm. uh, who asks I think it is an amazing to bring an unscientific topic like Christianity into a scientific environment. Was mm -hmm. it hard not to lose the scientific base? I mean, we are we are designers. Uh, you know, we, we, our class is, is industrial design, and uh, we know that we can you know work with customers. And often we don't. And nobody of us knows the customer that well. And same here, and we, we talked a lot to them, and uh, it was a very, very iterative process, and yeah, we got, we got somewhere. Um, yeah. it, it is, I mean, it's, it's not very scientific, but it's research, because it's a new field that we explore together, and uh, that's also what I like about the project. It's a very discussion provoking topic, apparently, because we have even the third question on YouTube. No. That, that, that <laughs> maybe I will invite you, Fabian, to maybe to answer it directly in the chat there, because I will give I it can, now. I can, I will yeah, do uh, it. Yeah, to Thomas to present the next paper. Okay. Because of the time issue. So, yeah. Yes. Thank you. And thank you again, Fabian, for the sure. talk. It's really great. Thank you. And uh, I feel honored to announce the next talk uh, from Frank Berusha with the title Alistic Intangible and Gestural User Interactions with and on a cooking pan.
thank you very much for this nice presentation. Um, so while we wait until some questions appear in YouTube, uh, I would like to start off with a question. And I, I, see, I see how you can translate this to user use cases, and this is definitely interesting work. Um, I, so I have actually two questions. I will start with the first one is, uh, what was the rationale behind exactly using a cook top task? I mean, you could have also used like, like a lot of other objects in the environment. What was the reason to actually look at pans and cooktops? I mean, uh, at the end, this is also really industrial research. So we really want to um, emphasize or find new and perhaps also innovative ways of how users really interact with the, with the cooktop and perhaps how we can, we can find uh, ways to, to have some, some more natural and fluent interaction mm -hmm. in the whole cooking process. So we were really specifically interested in this cooking uh, process and that's why we selected the pen. Mm -hmm. And the second question that adds to this is, did you already think of how from a technological perspective you would implement all of these features into, into a pen, for example. So you demonstrated that the pen can be touch sensitive, so you can actually uh, set the heat from the handle, but also at the same time, you would also be able to rotate your pen and have there some sort of interaction. And there must be some kind of logic behind it that can implement this. Did you already think about how you would do that? I think at the end, it's not too far away. I mean, we have connected cooktops already today. Uh, that can be controlled from, let's say, from, from outside, not using the conventional controls. Um, and, and we have, normally we have the, the cooker hood over the cooktop that has some space where you can install, uh, for example, a depth camera or a, a normal camera um, or other uh, sensors. So I would, I would not go and stick the sensors into the pans and into the, into the pots. I would rather stick it into the environment and specifically into the cooker hood. And I mean, there are already um, prototypes and, and projects out there and, and products out there that uh, have like projection interfaces in the kitchen that project content on the, on the kitchen surface. I have a short follow up on uh, Thomas question regarding usage of different pods or different everyday objects for controlling things, you know, because for one thing you have this frying pan where you use just one handed interaction. But what happens, for example, if you use two hands for the for the pan when you cook, or what happens if you have, for example, a cup, which is not dedicated to the particular surface where you can use it. So you can I can bring it to my table, I can bring it on the balcony. So, what are your thoughts about generalizability of those interaction techniques that you already explored on the frying pan? Uh, I mean. There were quite a lot of, um, or there was quite a lot of previous research in this field of um, repurposing everyday objects to to control uh, devices. But a lot of these um, previous projects or previous research came up with the question of how to link these two objects. So how to link the the object and the device that you want to control, and how to then again say now you're no longer linked. And so I think this is a a very special example here of, of cooktop and pan because there is they have some sort of natural relation right i mean as long as the pan is on the cooktop which has a natural border you can use it for this additional purpose and when it's outside um, rotating the pan or touching on the pan does not affect anything else or if you put a cup on the cooktop um, this does not affect cooktop temperature uh, for example so there is some let's say th there's some functional relation between these uh, two objects and th there are other pairs out there as well um, for example, I briefly mentioned the, the, the cup and the coffee machine where this would work as well. So rotating the cup under the coffee machine might, for example, um, change the, the coffee volume, uh, for example. But rotating a cup then outside just does not really uh, have an influence there. So I, I think there are, this is, this is one of the contributions. So this might generalize to, to some other um, pairs of object and, uh, and device that have this, this sort of relation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thomas, go ahead. Yeah, we still have one question on YouTube chat. Do we have time for that or not really? Yes. Okay, so um, this is one other person asking, did you consider potential conflicts when multiple pens need to be operated in a realistic setting? Actually, this was one of the feedback that we got from, uh, from a couple of subjects uh, that said, mm -hmm. okay, it works pretty well if you have only one pen. Um, it might be tricky uh, when you have multiple uh, pans on the on the stuff, and especially really rotating pans does not really work that well when you have uh, a lot of pans on your cooktop. Um, this the let's say the the more um, gestural interactions like 
touching on the uh, on the handle or swiping on the handle, they might still work also for a, for a setup where you have multiple pens. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there is one more idea also on the YouTube channel that maybe uh, Frank, I will invite you to maybe address it directly in the chat. Sure. Since we since we need to move to move on with the, to the different to another topic. Uh, sure. Thanks again. Thanks again. Okay, so the next paper is actually an invited talk, um, which was presented this year at CHI. And the name of the, of the paper is Rapid Iron on uh, User Interfaces, Heads on Fabrication of Interactive Textile Prototypes. And it's gonna be presented by Konstantin Klamka from Dresden. Hi everybody, and thanks for inviting me. My name is Konstantin Klamka, and today it's my pleasure to present you our project Rapid Iron on User Interfaces. This research was published at this year's CHI and is joint work with Raimund Daxelt from the Interactive Media Lab Dresden and Jürgen Stamle from the HGI Lab at Saarland University. So if we look at current trends of e-textiles, we see an increasing amount of emerging applications and use cases. However, the manual fabrication of e-textile interfaces on the yarn level is quite time-consuming and cumbersome. So an important question is how technology enthusiastic makers and innovative designers could take part in this development. To address these challenges, a lot of research has been done in crafting e-textiles, developing modular wearable toolkits, investigating advanced fabrication and sensing approaches, as well as creating cuttable smart tapes. In addition, interactive fabrication approaches focus on sequential or concurrent processes where the design and the fabrication process take place almost at the same time. These approaches often involve interactive handheld design tools. For instance, Sketch and Stitch combines the design of components by sketching and the fabrication by using an automated embroidery machine. But how can we design a handheld tool that allows to directly apply a variety of e-textile components onto textiles? Inspired by the sketching-like interaction of handheld correction tape or packaging tape dispenser, we introduce Rapid Iron On User Interfaces, a novel fabrication technique to combine design and fabrication into a single process. Therefore, we developed a handheld ironing tool that directly transfers adhesive, functional tapes and patches onto fabrics. The device uses an iron that could be pushed for bonding tapes via heat activation. The tapes itself are rolled on spools with a carrier layer. As you can see in the video, it is possible to iron on a single trace in a sketching-like fashion by pushing and moving the device. Furthermore, also multi-wire traces can be ironed on in the same manner. But how can we continue multi-traces in different directions? Angles and crossings can be realized by placing an ironing and connector stencil. Peeling off its protection layer. And sketching a buff with an inserted trace spool. We also fabricated stretchable traces, as well as shielded ones made of ultra-thin fabrics. Besides the different trace spools, we further present spools with isolation, conductive or resistive materials that allow designers to directly iron on versatile circuits and sensors onto the fabric. In addition, we introduce zip-on connections as exchangeable mechanisms for multiple purposes, like detaching electronic parts before washing or changing models depending on the context. So far we have learned to manage wiring, right? But what about further input, output and computing components? With our work, we also introduced a comprehensive library of components, which are mostly realized as functional patches to be ironed on in the same manner. So basically, it is possible to integrate prefabricated iron-on patches in a versatile way. For example, a designer can place an identification patch, then iron on the tag using our rapid iron-on tool, and finally peel off the protection layer. The result is a flexible and strongly connected tag that could be used, for instance, inside a lab code for access control. To demonstrate the versatility of our toolkit, we also implemented applications for ubiquitous and wearable computing, including a solar-powered smart bag with integrated lightning, a moisture sensor and music controls as the shoulder pads. 
Finally, we conducted technical experiments as well as hands-on sessions and reviews with fashion, textile and fiber experts. The expert reviews provide us insights into the design workflow and allow us to discuss technical parameters such as the required knowledge and costs, as well as the degree of integration, functionality and durability. If you are interested in getting further information, please refer to our full paper that is available in the ACM Digital Library as an open access download. Thank you for your attention and if you are looking for more details and building instructions, please check out our project page. And with that I am now looking forward to answering your questions. So, uh, thank you very much for the nice presentation and we have the first author here, Konstantin Klamka, who is uh, here to answer your questions about this work. And I would like to remind uh, everybody who is watching us on YouTube to ask your questions directly in the chat so we can read them and ask them Konstantin directly. Uh, while I'm waiting for the questions, I would like to uh, start with a couple of questions that I have. Um, so Christine, I would like to ask you about a bit more of the, about the requirements of the surfaces where you can put the, this conducting material on, right? So of course you, you know, you focus primarily on different types of fabrics and so on and so forth, but can, what is the space that I can use it? Can I use, for example, also on my skin, kind of a direction of the electronic tattoos? So what are the max and min? Thank you for your question. That's a good question. At the moment, we are focusing on textiles and we use this fusible web adhesive that is very common in the domain of textiles and we use heat activation to iron on and set the functional layer stick to the fabric. So it, with the current prototype and also with the focus and aim uh, from our project, we do not aim to iron on, on skin. I think it would, would hurt the person. But it's interesting, you can think about some devices that are able to make this on other surfaces, like you mentioned skin or rigid surfaces. But I think the textile domain is a very challenging one. And this is because we use this special adhesive uh, fusible webs and combine it with heat activation that results in very good um, results because it's a good connection. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, as kind of a follow-up question on that is regarding the, the connections that you can create on this kind of textiles, right? Yeah. Because as we saw in the video, you can do, of course, very clearly 90 degrees connections, maybe some other small angles, but how flexible you are with the trajectories. So can you do a bit more complicated shapes than, you know, the grids and some variations of those? Yeah, this is also a good question. Uh, it depends on the size of the rapid iron on tool. Uh, we present a, I would say, medium size where are fit in, uh, for example, four conductive lines. If you imagine you build it in a smaller size, you are not so limited in the curve radius. We can make some curve, but it's not like a penny where you can fully sketch. And if you need some strict angles or something like that, we propose these um, patches with these angles. And of course, you can arrange the, uh, the patches in a different angle. We showed in the video uh, a 90 degree angle, but you can do also others, of course. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So while we wait for some more questions, uh, I have one. So my impression is of, of having variables with which you can interact were prevented to go into the consumer market because they need a certain level of durability because you wash your clothes, right? And you stretch mm -hmm. them. Uh, at some point they get holes and so on. And this, this are all factors that need to be considered. Um, did you test the persistence of the printing on the clothes? So how persistent is it, for example, when you wash it or when you wear it over a long time? Yeah, first of all, uh, I want to, to um, highlight that this is a fabrication toolkit for, for fashion designers that are interested in prototyping iterations. It not, it's not uh, built for, for production at large scale uh, like others, but I think if, if you do some, um, some shielding and multiple layers, you can wash it in, in some degree, but it's never durability that you would say you would uh, produce a product with that. It's more like you support fashion tech designers or makers um, to have a toolkit to make fast iterations on the textile itself in, in a really sketchy way. Mm -hmm. So, however, I believe that this goes in the, the right direction. I mean, now it's only just a small step to get this into, into a commercial production. 
Uh, I have seen, so I really liked that idea of uh, having a tag in your clothes. Mm -hmm. And this tag was just a tag that is just printed, right? There's like no electronics behind it that, that you actually need to consider of. Yeah, I think this is a, a printed NFC tag. It's uh, made of conductive okay. printed antenna and there's a really, really small integrated circuit that you can bend and you can iron on and reuse it for a use case for medical applications, for example, for door or access control. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there are no more questions on, on YouTube and we are perfectly aligned in time. Yeah. Thank you again, Constantine. Yeah. Thank, you, Constantine. Thank you also. And uh, with this, I would like to announce the next talk with the title EMS-based Actuated Output Gestures, a Design Process for Novices. And this is presented by Oriol Dekbelo from the University of Münster. And I would like to mention that this paper got the Best Paper Award. So let's give him a hand. And today I'm presenting EMS-based Actuated Output Gestures, a Design Process for Novices. Nowadays, EMS-based gestures are used in many different scenarios. For instance, in ribbon pointing to identify targets, but also to extend... Um, even to communicate emotions from a sender to a receiver. In this case, the sender um, detects a movement and it's transmitted to a receiver via EMS-based gestures. As more complex and as more gestures you are using, as more effort it is to calibrate the gestures and to identify the right muscles and bring the gestures together to create a full EMS-based gestures. To explore such ideas, EMS toolkits helps. With such toolkits, you can um, actuate uh, muscles individually and calibrate them. However, in more complex scenarios, it's still a lot of effort um, to calibrate the, uh, the each muscle and also to actuate it, as you see on the video on the right. Therefore, we present a design process for novice. In the first step, you need to um, identify the gesture. Then you disassemble these gestures and sub-movements and timing. Then you identified um, the response or the corresponding muscles. Then you map the muscles and find the placement of the electrodes. Then you need to calibrate each muscle individually. Then bring them together, test them and adjust it as a full gesture. And finally, you trigger them uh, depending on the event. For this um, design process, we developed an app support. In our app, you can define uh, different timelines with actuation sequence, calibrate each, each muscle individually, connect these to a toolkit, and also map then each timeline to a specific muscle. We evaluated um, our design process and the, tool and the um, app in a, in a study with 12 participants. As results, we found that it's easy to decompose um, the gestures and sub-movements. It was a bit harder to identify the muscles and the placement of the electrodes. And it's, it's easy to map the sequence to the application. It was quite hard to add breaks into the timeline, which we fixed in the final version of our app. Let me sum this up. The design process helps for prototyping the app supports fast and easy iterations and all together it helps you to explore concepts and new gestures. Thank you for the talk. That, that is really interesting work. So we were ourselves working with EMS devices in our lab and uh, one of the challenges we had were like, were like actually programming and implementing these rhythms you need to, to force a user to do a certain movement using EMS. And uh, that's why I really appreciate this toolkit. It would be interesting to know if it is able, if you will, are able to do some sort of programming by demonstration approach. So for example, just as a note for future work, maybe that you put electrodes on your skin and you can do a certain movements to measure the actual EMG signal and translate this into an EMS movement. 
Do you think something like this would be possible? Or is there something... Yeah, go ahead. I think, uh, yeah, I mean, where I think in this work still at the manual approach, um, but I think what you are um, talking about goes a, a bit in, uh, in the direction of, uh, of also a bit of auto calibration, for example, uh, which I think will be totally possible in future work. Mm -hmm. And uh, another question is, do you know how fine grade you could implement the gestures in your app? So for example, when you're doing a pattern, What was like the minimum time you, where you can infuse electricity into a muscle so you can provoke a movement? Um, are there any boundaries or could you, could you just say, okay, now I want to, for a certain time of milliseconds, move an arm? Because if it's possible to do something like this, you could maybe even outperform human reaction by using EMS. We didn't, we didn't have a, a minimum time. Either. We rather, rather had a maximum time, which was five seconds. Uh, no, mm -hmm. Yes, five seconds. Yeah, but I think we did investigate it. That, that would be an interesting point. Mm -hmm. um, I have another question since we're still waiting for the questions in the chat. Um, I, I was uh, curious about the selection of the hand. Uh, so, why do you? I, I know that you guys focus primarily on the design around the hand. Uh, why? What was the choice? Why was it like this? And did you consider other body parts? I know, for example, legs as an extension, so to say. Uh, no, I think we just had this uh, this gesture because it involves quite a number of muscles already, um, and uh, it was also quite, um, let's say, quite easy to uh, to visualize to participants because I think they had to go, I mean, through all the process of identifying the muscles that are involved. In and so on. So we wanted something that is at the same time, not too complex, but also easy uh, for a first study. And this is the reason why we, uh, we kind of picked this. Okay. okay. I see. Thank you. Uh, Thomas, if you have no further questions, we have no further questions in the chat. No, we are perfectly in the schedule. Okay, then thank you very much, Ariel. And we will move on to the next uh, presentation. Uh, which is called Naughty Modes, an investigation of notification delay modes and their effects on smartphone users um, uh, by Romina Pogunte. And you're going to hear her voice in the presentation at least, but I know that Christina Schnegas is going to answer your questions later on from University of Stuttgart and LMU Munich. Naughty Modes, an investigation of notification delay modes and their effects on smartphone users. Besides the various positive effects smartphones have on our everyday life, there are also negative ones. For example, when incoming notifications lead to stress and anxiety. Prior work has explored many solutions, for example, presenting notifications in opportune moments, delaying them or filtering based on keywords. In our paper, we focus on what users experienced when they see different notification delay modes and use them for one week. Further, we were interested in their effects on their everyday life. For this, we first performed a focus group exploring what are favorable concepts for users. Based on these results, we implemented an Android application and tested this Android application in a four-week field study. Seven smartphone users discussed in a focus group and agreed that they wished to be notified in emergencies for any time. Further, they stated that prioritizing and filtering messages based on senders and apps is one of the most favorable concepts for them. Based on these results, we implemented three different modes in an Android application called Noti Modes. The fixed interval mode, user-defined interval mode and the sender-dependent mode. Each of these modes was used for one week by each user, plus a control week also for each of the users, of the 13 users. After each week, we conducted a semi-structured interview and asked about the user experience and the observed effects on their everyday life. From the study results, we could see that the sender-dependent mode and the user-defined interval mode were preferred. Particularly defining the silent time and 
the customization settings according to contacts were highly appreciated by the participants. Further, we could see that the positive effects that they reported on their daily routine, like for example, the checking habits that were changed, led to less distraction and made it easier to concentrate. Finally, we derived four design implications and as a conclusion, we could see that conscious management of notifications increases the awareness for one's reachability. Thank you for your attention. So thank you for an interesting talk. Um, we have uh, Christina Schneegas in the audience, the second author, to answer the questions about this work. I also again encourage people in YouTube chat uh, to answer questions directly there. Um, so, Christina, did you have any common preferences by users in the settings of the, of the notification? Because you had one setting where users could kind of set up preferences from how they want to use the notifications and whether like more common patterns, what they would like to use, or maybe there was participants that were like, I don't want any notifications, I'm happy without them. I think it was pretty depending a pretty individual decision, I would say. So um, I think the most, yeah, I think that it varied a lot depending on the attitude of the people towards putting the smartphone to the side for a while. So I think the only common thing was in the user-defined interval mode where they could actually define the, the resting interval themselves, where users put it mostly to something like an hour or two, like you would usually do for... Um, do not disturb smalls, for example. Mm -hmm. But besides that, it was pretty individual what, what people preferred. Okay, okay. And nobody asked for no notifications at all, except for those kind of pretty fine times. No. <laughs> okay. Um, Thomas? Just a very short one. Uh, you presented these free notification modes, and I was wondering in the study, could the participants freely choose which, which one they want to use, or were they assigned beforehand to one of these notification modes? It was a within subject um, okay. uh, user study. So every participant went through all of the three modes plus a control mm -hmm. week and the order of those uh, conditions were randomized. So each condition was uh, used for one week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So with this, I think it's, so if there are no further questions on YouTube and there are none, um, we will continue to the next talk. Thank you again, Christina, for the nice Thank talk. Thank you and for the Q&A. Mm -hmm. And the title of the next paper is Feeling Scarcity, Augmenting Human Feelings Through Physicalization of Animal Murder, Attention Depletion, and Energy Consumption. And this paper is also presented by Fabian Himmert from the Bergische Universität Wuppertal. In this project, we designed three objects that make scarce resources perceptible through physicalization. These are energy, attention and meat. They all are only concepts, but we hope that they will inspire future research in this area. The first object, the fireplace, displays energy through effort. It is a lamp that is connected to a smart home's smart meter. To provide the home with energy, the user has to set up the sticks on the fireplace. They are kept in place with magnets in the lamp's bottom plate. Each stick corresponds to one kilowatt hour. Over the course of the day, as energy is used, the sticks will start falling down. When no stick is left, the energy is turned off. To restore energy, the user has to go to the lamp and set up the sticks again. Thus, users are forced to reflect upon their energy consumption. Our second object, the cut, is a knife block. With an integrated scanner, it recognizes the product that the user is about to process with one of the knives. When meat is recognized, a haptic feedback mechanism inside the knife block is activated. This mechanism applies friction to the knife's blade, causing a feeling similar to pulling the knife out of a living body. An effort that requires the user to be brutal. Thus, users are forced to reflect upon their meat consumption. Our third object is a router. It measures the amount of data that was downloaded. Through shape change, it symbolizes the depleting attention of the user over the course of the day. After being fully empty, data connection is cut off. 
It then has to be reset, restoring connectivity and its original shape. Thus, users are forced to reflect upon the depletion of their attention over the course of the day. Thank you, Fabian, for this very interesting video and talk. And you already said it before that you're, you're more from the, from the design side of HCI. And um, here it would be interesting to see how would you evaluate these devices if they really provoke a change in behavior for humans? Mm. Because, for example, I can imagine that for the Wi-Fi scenario, you're in, so maybe I'm getting it wrong, but you were intending to maintain the attention Of, of persons by cutting off the Wi-Fi, but I can imagine if when I work focused on something and then the Wi-Fi turns off, I have to accidentally break my attention, stand up and turn it on again. Um, totally. Uh, and you, have, you yeah. probably likewise wouldn't buy a knife block that you know prevents you from using the knife if you want to cut meat with it. Um, and also cutting off the power of the flat is not fun. Um, true. And that's why, I mean, they are only concepts and they will probably stay in that status because, yeah, I mean, if you would try to sell such a product, nobody would buy it. Yeah. Yeah. So what I see here is that, that you have like this concept of a fitness tracker for scarcity mm -hmm. that you are like, and I think mm -hmm. this power, this, this power aspect is really interesting because mm -hmm. especially when people are in quarantine, um, right. they might have their power consumption way better than the, when they would go to work where you would not have something like this. Um, yeah. So I, I like the concepts, they're really interesting and they are something also outside of the box. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's a student project, you know, they, they are three students and we really spend a long time on, on developing simple mechanisms, simple, simple objects that, yeah, let us feel uh, what we can't feel otherwise. And that is how scarce these things are really. Mm. Yeah. I also see somehow over these two papers that you, you presented, this kind of tendency of transforming these spiritual things into tangibility and now kind of awareness into tangibility. Right. And I, I also was uh, kind of thinking of this concept, you know, when about uh, when you use your iPhone and end of end of the week, you get this report that your average <laughs> time of, of usage iPhone oh, was, every was, yeah. <laughs> was this and this and this and that. I was thinking that maybe it would be even better to, for, for your field study when you're going to mm, right. com compare it against notifications, for example, because I, I, can understand, I can imagine that, yeah, we can just, you know, cut the internet in, so to say, not very opportune moments, right, right. but maybe notifications mm. would be something to use. I don't know whether you guys consider it or what were your thoughts, uh, you know, for mm -hmm. notifications in the future. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely interesting. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, we have no further questions in the chat. So with this, I would like thank you, Fabian. Again I will stay for... in the chat if there is something coming up. Yes, I yes, will because right. sometimes sometimes we have delays, so maybe uh, just have an eye on that. Yeah. But thanks, thank for you your, for your answers. Mm -hmm. And now we go into the last uh, paper in in this session, uh, which is called uh, CoFind, a browser plugin for investigating collocated collaborative web search. Uh, by uh, Robert Fullman, but I think we have uh, Raymond Daxak here to, uh, for the for the questions part uh, from University of I Dresden, uh, or maybe nobody. I don't know. We will see later. I think Anke Lehmann is here. Uh, Anke Lehmann. Okay, sorry. Uh, Anke Lehmann is here, and also I'd like to mention that this paper got the base best, best paper award and mentioned computer this year. So a uh, round of applause for this paper, and. Yeah, let's hear. Hello, everybody. My name is Anke Lehmann from the Interactive Media Lab Dresden, and I will present our work CoFind. We developed CoFind as a research platform, which allows us to investigate group awareness for collaborative web searches. In this context, we think the role of information sharing is crucial. Here, we concentrate on the dimensions of what information is shared and when is it shared. The configuration of these dimensions has positive and negative effects on collaboration. For example, an automatic synchronization of all user activities might lead to high distraction, while a manual approach could address this, but would also require more user interaction. To better understand this effect, we propose to look at different sharing modes. An automatic mode where all necessary information like open pages or bookmarks are shared instantly with all group members, and an explicit mode where users have to share each single web page manually and in between a snapshot mode where users define when to share all necessary information with all group members. As a starting point of such an investigation, we developed our own browser plugin called CoFind. 
The main purpose of COFIN is to provide basic means for conducting and observing synchronous collaborative web search. It supports the three sharing modes and provides activity logging. The COFIN plugin extends the UI of the web browser. We have an integrated sidebar on the left side with different spaces. The group space is a joint collection of bookmarked web pages of all group members. The activity space where users can share their currently open web pages and the private space which provides user specific cross device access to currently open web pages that are not shared with others. Hello. As you might have noticed, each component has a detail button which opens a landing page to show more information about the shared items. In our lab experiment, we tested the feasibility of our study tool. We took a closer look into possible disturbing effects like the plugin itself and the chosen setup. We evaluated only the automatic mode as we assumed some kind of distraction. We successfully used our CoFin plugin, which is why we think it can serve as a research tool for further investigation of group activity and group awareness. The logging data of our three teams already showed typical collaborative phases. For example, tablets were used for individual web search and the large shared display was used for discussion and collaborative search. We also observed much verbal communication between the team members, mostly to prevent double work. Moreover, the activity space, which allows to monitor other work, was not exploited in its full potential. But we assumed that searches comprising longer periods of individual work could still benefit from this feature. In future, we will look at different visual representation of shared information. For example, in the automatic sharing mode, all data is synchronized in real time. And for the other non-automatic mode, it appears to be particularly important to focus on highlighting changes between events. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions to our CoFind project, please contact us. And if you are interested in using our tool, have a look at our website. Thank you, Anke, for this interesting concept. And uh, while we wait for the delay to be compensated in YouTube to see the questions, um, I would start, like to start off with a question. And I have seen that you have run a user study with three participants uh, in different groups. And uh, you were already using the tool you have presented for the, for the shared spaces. And I was interested in, do you know how people usually plan their travels? No, now specifically to this task. And did you compare how people would usually do that uh, to your approach? Uh, just a short correction. There were um, three teams with um, three um, people oh. in each group. So we had uh, nine participants. Um, we. Uh, Ask the, um, the groups how they normally um, used um, web search, um, for example, for a travel planning task. And some of them also used a kind of collaboration, mostly remote and also co-located. And, but we do not um, yeah, lock this data for these groups. Um, but there's also in the um, related work that this is one of the typical um, tasks for co-located um, web search activities, for example. Yeah, that's that's really interesting because I can imagine because like travel planning, especially with multiple people, is something that is very it can become very extensive in the demands of organizing it. Um, do you plan to do a large scale study? So, so as far as I understood, it was a browser plugin, right? So it would be easy to push it out and see if other people use it and lock the data from this to see how people use that, um, albeit from using it for browser plugins. Are there any plans to run a large scale study on this? Um, not at the moment, because um, in the next steps, we also plan to um, test the other um, modes. And for the, um, yeah, for the testing, you also need uh, to set up a kind of server to um, all recognize the uh, logging data. So it's, I think it's not too easy to make a, yeah, a huge um, participant study. And we also focusing on um, co-located um, web search. So, but we also plan to use a kind of um, hybrid collaboration study. So we have a co-located group and also had some um, team members, they uh, work remote with this co-located group. So we think that will um, also influence the kind of communication and maybe we need some additional um, tools or communication hints for the remote people. Mm -hmm. Really looking forward to see where this work is going and what the results are.
And I think with this, we are already out of time for this session. And Andri and I want to thank you for attending this session. And we also want to give a hand to all the speakers for giving their great uh, talks and Q&As. Um, and with this, I said in the beginning of the session that there will be breakout rooms. With this, I meant, of course, the Discord channels uh, where you can occasionally meet um, the authors in case you have more questions. And with this, uh, we would like to close the session and would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you.